Guys, welcome to session six of Putting Sin to Death. What we want to do in this session is up until now, we've been thinking of all of the theory and the principles that go into putting sin to death. And what we want to figure out is how do we take all of that and squeeze it into the space of real busy life. A few months ago, I had a new refrigerator brought to the house. In theory, it was a very simple process. I knew exactly where the new refrigerator needed to go, where the old one had been. There was a spot cut out of the counter where it should slide right in. But the problem was fitting it in. And it actually took several hours. It took taking doors off in order to get this refrigerator where it needed to go. And I think for me, that's an illustration of the difficulty of spiritual disciplines. Often the problem's not really that we don't understand what we ought to be doing. The challenge is how we fit what we need to do into the space of life when all of us feel like there is more that needs to be done than we ever have the chance of getting done. So here's what I want to do. I want to talk about the prerequisites for doing this. So what are the components that you're going to need in everyday life in order to put sin to death? I want to talk about uh, the system. Uh, what is a method or what is a device, a tool that can help you when you're actually trying to confess your sins? I want to talk about some uh, of the rhythm that's required because you're going to need a daily, a weekly, probably an annual rhythm. I want to think about some of the habits that promote this work. And finally, I want to think about really next steps. How do you lay out four, five practical, simple things that you could begin to do? that would help you in this task of putting sin to death. So let's start with the prerequisites. Here's the first one, guys. It's not an easy one. Solitude. You will not be able to deal with your sin unless you are able to find quiet space where you can be by yourself in the presence of God. I'd love to tell you that that's not required, but it is. The reason it's required is in order to deal with sin, you've got to develop true self-knowledge. And that's not easy to come by. St. Augustine, he said, how can you draw close to God if you are far from your own self? John Calvin began his famous work of theology, the Institutes, saying our wisdom consists almost entirely of two parts, our knowledge of God and of ourselves. So guys, it will take being detached from technology detached from noise. And we'll talk more about what that might look like for you, but solitude, it's a requirement. Here's another requirement, the scriptures. You are going to need the scriptures, the Bible, God's word in your life. At some point, go read Psalm 19. It's a beautiful psalm. It begins with the image of the sun and the way that the sun gives light to the whole of the earth. Think about it for a moment. If we had no artificial lighting, and the sun didn't shine, how much could we see? Nothing. And the psalmist uses that as a picture of the way that God's word gives light to us spiritually. So that apart from his word, we'd never be able to identify what sin is. We would never know what holiness is. We're absolutely dependent upon the light of his word for all of our spiritual knowledge. And so, guys, the scriptures are going to be required. Here's another thing you're going to need. You're going to need prayer. Now, guys, prayer, this is the basic breathing motion of the Christian life. You know, we inhale God's word. We exhale prayer. We speak our thoughts to him. And Psalm 139 ends with this prayer that God would search the heart, that he would try our anxieties that he would lead in a path of righteousness. And we need more than the word of God. We need the spirit of God actively searching and examining our heart to do this work. Guys, you're going to need a strategy. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But the last thing I would say as a kind of prereq is you will need some spiritual friends. There is a military historian I love to quote, uh, Slam Marshall. And he wrote a book. And in this book, Men Against Fire, there are a lot of wonderful quotes regarding friendship, but here's one. He said, when you prepare to fight, you must prepare to talk. 
You must learn that speech will help you save your situation. You must be alert at all times and let others know what is happening to you. You must use your brain and your voice any time that any work of yours can help others. Don't try to win a war or capture a hill all by yourself. You are a tactical unit and you must think of yourself that way. Your action alone means nothing, or at best very little. It is when you talk to others and they join with you that your action becomes important. And I would say that your action becomes effectual. You will be assisted in this work if you surround yourself with men who you can communicate with regarding the inner struggles of your heart. Those are the prerequisites. Let's move on to the next big idea, which has to do with the system. Now, when it comes to dealing with sin, most guys don't have a system. In fact, most good Christian men, if you asked how strategic they are about dealing with their sin, they probably don't do anything more than occasionally saying, Dear God, I'm sorry. Now, I think that's unfortunate. I'm convinced that our spiritual lives ought to be uh, the most strategic and least casual elements of our lives. I think men, if men showed half the interest in organizing their prayer life that they show to organizing their finances, it would be incredible to see the kind of growth that might occur in their life. And so I think we need to take that strategic ability and we need to implement it in terms of thinking about topics like dealing with sin. Now, what are the marks of a useful system? It's always two. It's simple, it's effective. Guys, if something's complicated, you're never gonna use it. If something's ineffective, it's not worth using. And so what you need is some kind of tool that will assist you in this work. And here's what I'd recommend to you. It's not the only system. You could think of a different one. This is just something that somebody recommended to me and I'm gonna recommend it to you. It's a prayer binder. All it takes, you get a binder, you get some section divisions, you get some loose leaf paper, you get a pencil, and you print a few things off to put inside your binder. And you've got a tool that will greatly help you improve your time of confession. So what is in this binder for me? So if I go to the section for confession, so you might have other sections for other parts of prayer, but you open up to confession, what I have first are some printed out copies of what I would call diagnostic texts. I need something that can sweep my heart and bring out into focus the sin that otherwise I'd never know was there. And so, uh, some examples of this, I've got printed off the Ten Commandments. Because if I need if I'm struggling to think of what to confess, if I read through those commandments, and let's say you get down to thou shalt not covet, well, all of a sudden I've got something I can confess. I've got a uh, part of the Sermon on the Mount. You try to get through the Beatitudes without being cut and bleeding. It's impossible. My heart's not poor. I've not shown mercy. I'm not thirsting for righteousness. Um, I've you know, exerted myself in anger. I've not been meek. I'm not a peacemaker. Um, wonderful text to stick in here. How about 1 Corinthians 13, Paul's chapter on love? Again, you try to go through those verses and not identifying some ways that you're falling short of the glory of God. Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. There are plenty of examples. Here's the point. Print off one or two texts that are useful for you to see sin that otherwise would go unnoticed. And so I've got those, and then I've got some loose leaf paper. What I do with the paper is, as I'm reading, if there's anything that all of a sudden I see that's a really powerful insight that I don't want to forget, I write it down. Guys, you got to realize that your mind holds ideas as well as your hands when cupped hold water. Don't ever trust yourself to retain a good idea, a real critical insight. And so if God shows you something, you write it down, a place that you can go back and find it again. And so I've got those printed out kind of diagnostic text. I've got some loose leaf. And then I've got some scripts to help me pray. So Psalm 51 is a great example. You could print out Psalm 51. This is David's confession after he sinned with Bathsheba and put her husband to death. And, you know, in order to warm my heart, because 
typically my heart's pretty cold when I come into confession. But I tell you what, after having searched a little bit and having seen some things I'd not seen or thought about, and then all of a sudden reading through a prayer like that, or Psalm 32, or there's other examples, or you could print off um, something from Valley of Vision or one of these prayer books, but those words, it's like they stir the embers, and all of a sudden, you know, my emotions, my contrition, my godly sorrow is worked up a little bit more. And that's the, the power of this device. And so what it does is through using something like this, all of a sudden, I'm not relying upon my uh, mind in the moment to think of things to confess. But I'm able to be more thoughtful, and I'm also able to be more specific. So every sin I see... I'm not just saying, God, please give me grace today. I'm saying, God, uh, you see how I've been impatient with my wife and my kids, that I'm not showing kindness. Even when my words try to be kind, my facial expression is callous. Um, I want you to make me into a kind man. I want you to make me a man like Jesus who sympathizes and has compassion and uh, doesn't get annoyed by the needs of others. Guys, the more specifically you can ask for grace, the more powerful you will find grace at work in your life. And so there's an example. This may not be the system that you adopt, but my encouragement would be to not be so foolish to think that you can go without a plan. So we've talked about the prerequisites. We've talked about a system. What I want to talk about now is a rhythm. So if you want this uh, discipline of putting sin to death, to be a part of your life, you're going to have to think about when you're going to do it. My encouragement would be to have a daily rhythm, a weekly rhythm, and you're probably going to need an annual rhythm. So let's start with the daily. This is a daily work, guys. Um, I hope that you have some prayer time. It may not be much, but I hope that there is you know, a few minutes at least that you set aside. And really there are two options. There's morning and there's evening. Because the middle of the day is just too busy to get it done. And my advice would be to do it in the morning. Here's why. First, your mind is clear. It's not yet cluttered with all of the tasks that you're going to have to accomplish in, in the uh, for the remainder of your day. You've got a clear mind. Secondly, your mind's not yet exhausted. Unless you are somebody who just uh, is an owl and comes to life in the evening. By the time you get to the end of your day, you're going to be exhausted and have no bandwidth left. And so my encouragement would be to do it in the morning. And to take that time and to improve the element of confession in your prayer. Usually when we pray to God, we ask him for things. Maybe we'll even say thank you. But we don't really think about the confession. So take a few minutes and try the prayer binder that I've just recommended to you. Make that a daily habit. But you're also going to need a weekly habit. The fact is, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday... Even if you attempt to be disciplined, you are still going to be caught up with the busyness of life. And so you're still not going to be able to devote enough uh, concentration to this work. And so let me recommend an idea to you. Here's how I think about Sunday. If there's anything that I've not been able to get done through the week spiritually, then I try to allot extra time for it on Sunday. And... Guys, Sunday morning, before you go to church, could you not carve out, let's say 20 minutes, to take a slower uh, walk through the steps that I've described with, say, a prayer binder, to think a little bit more, be a little bit more reflective before God, and to work that into a daily routine where you set that time aside, you will actually find that your church service will be more encouraging to you because you're going to go in with a heart that's already heated with the love of Jesus. Weekly routine, but guys, then you're going to need a yearly routine. There are sins that just go so deep down that we can't sufficiently detach and get perspective even on a Sunday morning. You know, that you really have to find a day or like a weekend to get that solitude so all of a sudden, it's just you in the presence of God, and he's got that jackhammer, and he's chipping, and he's pounding through the concrete that's hardened over your heart until finally he gets down to the soft stuff, the flesh underneath, 
and you're able to be reoriented and your values are able to be reorganized. Guys, that doesn't happen in 20 minutes. That might take two days to really occur. And so let me encourage you to think about even an annual rhythm where you allow yourself the space to do this. So we've got the prerequisites, we've got the system, we've got the rhythm. Let's move on to habits. If you really want mortification to begin to happen in your life, then you're going to need to develop more than conscious activity. Because the truth is, your mind is going to have to be focused on a lot of other topics and issues and items through the day. And so what you want is to develop habits, because the wonder about habits is you don't have to think about them. They happen. And so let me list some habits that you can develop that promote this work. One is to develop a passion for holiness, to where you hunger and thirst and crave any insight, any knowledge that you can gain about what righteousness is, about what it means to live a God-honoring life, about what sin is. You know what's interesting is uh, I, I like football. I like American football. I like the New Orleans Saints. Now, I don't read a lot of, uh, I don't visit ESPN, its website very often. I don't read the sports page frequently. But it's amazing how I never fall very far behind on the conversation about the Saints. Because just walking around, having conversations, looking at the front page when it's sitting there at a restaurant, you pick up information and you retain it. And that's what happens when you develop a passion for something. You just kind of absorb knowledge, even when you're not trying to. And guys, what will happen if you begin to develop a real passion for holiness, then you will be become like, I've got some chickens in my side yard. All day they're scraping around the dirt. And most of the time they're not finding anything. But I tell you what, if they see any little bug, no matter how small it is, they consume it. And what will happen is you'll be sitting in church, and honestly it will be a pretty rotten sermon. Uh, but then all of a sudden he's gonna, the preacher says something, and it's like, whoa, I've never thought about that before. And you won't miss it because you're hungering and thirsting, and you collect it, and you consume it, and you digest it. Develop a passion, guys, for holiness. Here's another habit. Guys, develop the habit of fixing your mindset every day, realizing that you are stepping out into a combat zone. So often we struggle with sin because we are careless in terms of believing that there is a devil and there is indwelling sin and there is a dark world that we exist within. If you want to develop a mindset of uh, engaging in spiritual combat, let me encourage you to go Google St. Patrick's Breastplate. It was St. Patrick's Day yesterday. It's a wonderful old prayer where he identifies, yeah, the devil is out there, sin is out there, so I'm going to need Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ to my right, Christ to my left, Christ in me, I mean, Christ in the people I encounter. I mean, he just surrounds himself in this environment of God, of Christ, of grace, recognizing that's what it's going to take to get through this day. If you were to read through that in the morning, you would begin to develop not the mindset that every day is a playground, let's go out and have fun, but every day is a battle. Let's put on the armor and let's go accomplish the mission that the commanding officer has given us. Guys, I could mention one. I'll mention one other habit, though. Develop the habit of being honest and transparent with a trusted circle of Christian friends. Sin loves the darkness. I tell you what, you pull back the curtain, you let the light shine on it, and all of a sudden, its roots begin to be eaten away. Don't let it fester by keeping it private. Find some Christian friends, and if you need help uh, beginning to have a more vulnerable, honest, transparent conversation, then let me just encourage you, use John Wesley's five questions that he gave to his bands. Here they are. This is what used to gather Christians in little groups of four to six, and every week they'd answer these five questions. Number one, where have I sinned since we last met? Number two, where have I been tempted since we last met? Number three, how has God delivered me from my temptation? Four, is there anything I'm not certain if it's a sin or not? And five, 
Is there anything I'm keeping secret in my life? I'll tell you what, you go through those questions and a lot's going to be exposed that otherwise would be kept hidden. There are some habits. Now let's go to the next main topic I want to discuss. Uh, this is the special tactics that are going to be required for entrenched sin. So up until now, I have been giving you some advice on how to deal with kind of the everyday struggle of sin. But, you know, it's another issue when sin is like an oak tree that has set roots into your life. And, you know, you're trying to deal with sin that has established itself over years, maybe decades. So what do you do with that kind of sin? Um, I'm going to limit my comments here. I just want to encourage you to think about some things because this will take more than just a prayer binder. This will take more than just a time of confession. There will be some sins that you're going to have to deal with the emotional depths of the problem. So let's say you're a man who struggles with anger and that you even uh, react violently when you get angry. And you know maybe, if you stop to think about it, it's the exact same kind of behavior that you saw in your father. But if you go back far enough that he saw in his father and you realize that, you know, that there is deep underlying hurt. You know, there are uh, ways of relating to people that you inherited without even thinking about it. The emotional depths of that kind of problem and that kind of sin are, are deep and are going to require some special work. It may require bringing in a Christian counselor. Guys, there are some sins where, again, you're going to have to deal with the cognitive depth of the issue. You know, we can become addicted in our thinking. This is part of the difficulty with, say, pornography. And to, you know, begin to uh, diffuse the trigger on these patterns of thinking is going to take focused effort. And you can go back to the talk where we talk about uh, detect, reflect, accept, reject these four words this idea you know with something like lust where you need to detect that now this is my trigger and that you need to reject one lie you need to accept a truth and that you're gonna have to do that again and again and again until really your brain is almost rewired sometimes there is a cognitive depth that we have allowed ourselves to habituate our mind in certain ways it will take additional work to overcome guys there are some sins that you're gonna have to deal with the emo or rather the environmental depth of the Sin. So let's say you're a dad, and you can see your life is out of control, that you are trying to do way too much, your kids' lives are far too active, that you don't have time to feed your own soul, and you don't have any time to disciple your kids. Instead, you're just like the taxi, just shuttling people around nonstop. And if you're not in the car, then you're on Excel working out the spreadsheets for work, and you can just see that life's out of control. And truth be told, your life looks like everybody else you know who's following the exact same pattern. Now, guys, often we put ourselves in an environment that feeds the issue. When that is the case, sometimes you've got to detach. That's where that weekend away is going to be so vital to detach and get some perspective. To not just think what's normal and what is good is what you see in the lives of the people around you, but to regain God's perspective, his priorities, develop a plan of action, come back and implement it, even if it's against the grain of the environment around you. Just realize your struggles will be reinforced by the environment around you, and often you're going to have to be deliberate to overcome that environment. And guys, another depth to think about with these entrenched sins is often there's a spiritual depth that will have to be dealt with. Somebody mentioned this just recently, and it was so good, talking about when he ministers to other guys, often a question he asks is, is there any unconfessed sin holding you back? That's often the case. That there's been something in the closet that you've been afraid to look at and that you've not wanted to show anybody else and because you've tried to bury that guilt and hide it, that in even indirect ways that has fed into other issues in your life. And the truth may be that until you confess that sin before God and possibly before another person, that some of the other issues aren't going to go away. 
And so I say all of that just to be honest and say that there are deeply embedded sins that are going to take additional labors in order to really deal with. Now that brings us to the end, guys. What I want to do, I realize that this is overwhelming. It's a lot of information. It's a lot of advice. So let's chart a simple path for you forward. What would it look like, given all that we've described, for you to begin to make some changes that could make a big difference in beginning to see some sin put to death in your life? I'll give you four steps. First one, guys, make a prayer binder. It's not that hard. Get yourself a binder and get yourself the sections, the paper, print off a few key passages, and I would bet that that will give you something to work with that would help you. Make yourself a prayer binder. Guys, the second step I'd recommend would be to improve your daily time of confession using that binder. So now when you sit down and you're trying to confess before God, it's not just you and whatever's in your head at the moment, but you've got a tool. And so if you ordinarily, if ordinarily your confession is nothing more than saying, God, I'm sorry for sins, then try to develop that a little bit. Remember to always measure your progress, not against the ideal, but against where you are. So if you're somebody who typically spends five seconds in confession, well, why not devote five minutes? And to allow yourself to reflect a little bit more, to maybe read through a prayer like Psalm 32, to give you some words of confession and see if that doesn't help. Guys, your third step would be this. On Sunday mornings, like I said before church, spend an additional 20 to 30 minutes. Given the importance of putting sin to death, that's a small investment, a small ask. Take that 20, 30 minutes and be a little bit more reflective. Find a little bit more solitude. And guys, the fourth step would be to go and find either a day or a weekend to dig deeper in your life and to really see what God would identify as an area that needs to be dealt with. What would the cost be? Well, guys, we're talking five minutes on weekdays. We're talking 20 minutes on a Sunday. We're talking a day out of your year. Remember Romans 8.13. If we live by the flesh, we will die. But if by the Spirit we put to death the deeds of the body, we will live. Is it not worth five minutes on a Monday? Twenty minutes on a Sunday? A day out of the year? In order to see those parts of you begin to die which are having negative effects on your kids, on your spouse, on the whole career and the whole life that you've set up for yourself. It is worth the investment to begin to take your sin seriously. God's given us all the resources we need. So whatever the system, whatever the plan, guys, just don't be negligent. Put off the old man and guys begin to put on the new man renewed in the image of Christ. God bless you.